It should be, um, sorry, let me just, let me log back in for you. There, so you'll see it. Oh, I'll see it there. Okay. Okay. Just
So I guess some people are going before me. What time should I try to make sure I, I wrap it up by? <laughs> Okay, okay, great. So this is what I thought of chairs. Okay, I got Thank you. <laughs> she offered that program. Oh, yeah, that was um, what you're supposed to say.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the San Diego Public Library. I'd like to introduce our library director, Misty Jones. Ooh, good evening, and welcome to the inaugural Clara Breed Civil Liberties Lecture. I am uh, Library Director Misty Jones, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Tonight's lecture is named after former San Diego Public Library Director Claire Breed, who is best known for her activism and advocacy on behalf of the Japanese American community unjustly incarcerated during World War II. The library will be hosting a civil liberties lecture every year in her honor. And what better way to kick off this tradition than with the amazing Renee Tajima Pena. On behalf of the San Diego Public Library, I'd like to thank California Humanities, a partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which generously funded the series that tonight's lecture is part of. The Rebellious Misbreed, San Diego Public Library, and the Japanese American Incarceration. I'd also like to thank the San Diego Public Library Foundation for their generous support of tonight's event, including the delicious food catered by United Women of East Africa. And a special thanks to Moni Tong and Mark Cherry for their tireless work on this project. Without their inspiration, we would not be here tonight. So thank you. So before we hear from Renee, we have actor and voiceover artist, Kim Miller, doing a dramatic reading of a letter written to Clara Breed, a high school senior, Fusa, Sumagari, who wrote over 30 letters to Miss Breed during her incarceration. Kim graduated from UCSD and the American Conservatory Theater before serving as Associate Artistic Director for the San Diego Asian American Repertory Theater. She has appeared on many local stages, including the La Jolla Playhouse, Lamb's Players, and the San Diego Repertory in February, she will be performing in Sondheim's Assassins at East West Players in Los Angeles. 
please join me in welcoming Kim to the stage. Good evening. Uh, Fusa Tsumagari wrote over 30 letters, as she mentioned, and her letters expressed the griefs and hopes that she had for those in the camps, her family, and Miss Breed herself. Always quick to apologize for not writing sooner, her words always kept a positive outlook during bleak times. The following is a letter to Clara Breed from Fusa Tsumagari, Arcadia, California, May 22nd, 1942. Santa Anita Assembly Center, Barrack 31, Avenue S, Unit 3, District 6, Arcadia. Dear Miss Breed, thanks very much for the pictures. We just laughed and laughed and laughed over them. The funny smiles on our faces really had us in fits. The last two or three days has been terribly hot. According to our thermometers, it's been in the 100 degrees. Golly, it certainly is tiring to have such a sudden heat wave. Right now, it's rather on the chilly side. I read in the papers that San Diego had only a mild 79 degrees. You know, things here are changing all the time. In regards to your plans for coming here, I'll have to be a wet blanket again. An announcement came out that districts one, two, and three may have visitors on Sunday this week, and the rest of the districts must have visitors on Saturday. The next week it will be in reverse. Why don't you plan to come up on the 31st, a Sunday? The visiting hours are from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Since you mentioned the fact that you would like to come in the morning, maybe we could arrange to have it that way. Please let me know what you have decided to do. One thing is certain though, I can't meet you this Sunday. Another announcement just came out stating that the fact that we cannot receive any perishable or non-perishable food here. The only thing we can bring in from the outside is candy. Gee, that really makes me mad. On top of that, the canteen has stopped selling cookies, sandwiches, cakes, and all sorts of sweets except candy. We have all come to the conclusion that the mess halls will have to serve us better food. Gee, I like stew, but I don't like to eat at three meals in succession. Gee, I always get onto the subject of food. Well, don't blame me too much as that is about the only thing we think about. We've moved again. This makes the third time we've moved inside this camp. We're now in smaller rooms. We no longer live in stables, but in regulation army barracks. The only difference is that these barracks originally had three large rooms. Now they have been partitioned into six rooms, three large ones and three small ones. We live in one of the smaller ones since there are only three of us. The room is ideal for two, but is rather crowded with three. We have one large shower and one large laundry room. We certainly don't see how they expect over 16,000 people to be clean and also have their clothes clean. Many of the women get up about 5 a.m. and go to wash. If you try to go about 8 a.m., you're bound to have to wait a good hour or more. However, this is being quickly remedied for we can see three construction on their way up. They're, so we've been told, all for showers and laundry rooms. Anyhow, we certainly hope so. The only thing they don't have here is a dry cleaners. I don't know how to get my things really clean. We use gasoline and also a wet cloth, but it just doesn't seem to be really clean. The library here is progressing nicely. We've had many books donated from the nice San Diego people. We've had some from some of the state college teachers and of course, some very nice books from you. A girlfriend of mine told me that they had the whole office full of books to be filed and set up for public use. The head librarian is Anna Morikawa. I believe you may know her. She lived in Old Town and I used to see her at the children's library once in a while. She is a very soft-spoken person with the cutest dimple. I don't know if that helps any though. I see Tetsuzo once in a while now. I used to see him every day, but I was transferred to another district and don't see him very often. I was thinking about your being on a sugar ration. At first, I thought that we had it pretty soft because that was one thing that we didn't have to wait in line for. About a week ago, we had sugar for breakfast but none for lunch or supper. 
Then this morning, we didn't even have any sugar for breakfast. The waitresses told us that they'd run out of sugar. I guess you people are better off in the long run. You asked me what kind of magazine I like. Hmm. Well, I like any kind which concerns the home and clothes and looks. Well, you know, for example, the Good Housekeeping, Ladies Home Journal, etc. One magazine I would like is one full of crossword puzzles. My friend in the office, my friends in the office are just crazy over crossword puzzles. I'm not very good at them, but it's a lazy person's method of increasing the vocabulary. I guess my typing must be just driving you crazy. I make so many errors that it really isn't funny anymore. Can you imagine? I used to be able to type very accurately once. I can't blame it on the typewriter because it's a brand new, well, it hasn't been used very much, royal. Hmm. I guess it's just me. Thank you very much for everything. I really appreciate your very kind interest in me. Yours truly, Fusa Tsumagari. All I can say is, wow. Um, thank you so much, Kim. Um, the letters written to Clara Braid are just incredible and heartbreaking. Um, and you can read more letters at the library's gallery exhibition across the hall or across the courtyard to uh, call to serve Clara Breed and the Japanese American incarceration or on the website of the Japanese American National Museum, which houses the entire collection of over 300 letters written to Clara by San Diego Japanese American youths. You can also watch more dramatic readings of the letters by our partner, Write Out Loud, at sandiego.gov backslash misbreed. I now have the pleasure of introducing tonight's inaugural Clara Breed Civil Liberties Lecture Speaker, Renee Tajima Pena. Tajima Pena is a groundbreaking artist and public intellectual whose Academy Award nominated film, Who Killed Vincent Chin, ignited a push for Asian American rights and changed the course of the American legal history. She has dedicated her craft to amplifying Asian American and Latino voices. From third generation Japanese Americans grappling with cultural identity in My America, or Honk If You Love Buddha, to forced sterilizations of Mexican born women in East Los Angeles in No Mas Bebes, Tajima Pena has driven our conversations of inclusion past the American black and white binary. Most recently, Tajima Pena is the producer and showrunner for the 2020 six part PBS series, Asian Americans. She is the co-founder executive producer of the May 19 project, a social media campaign that amplifies the legacy of interracial solidarity. And as if she's not busy enough, Renee is the director of the Center for Ethno Communications at UCLA, where she also holds an endowed chair in Japanese American studies. So please join me in welcoming her to the San Diego Public Library. Thank you. Thank you, Misty. The three M's from the library, Misty, Mark, and Moni. Thank you. And all of you for skipping happy hour. I guess you can be in happy hour around here and coming to hear me talk. Um, so this is really meaningful to me, Claire Breed, uh, for several reasons. One, I kind of grew up in the library. My mother was a clerk typist in our local library. So I spent many afternoons after school hanging out at the library. Um, the rebellious Miss Breed, I really love that because I grew up very rebellious. And um, of course, because I'm, I'm third generation Japanese American and the story, the letter you just read could have been written by my mom, who's there on the right. That's my mother. And they were, in fact, they were also in Santa Anita in the horse stables when they were first um, evacuated, rounded up, imprisoned um, at the Santa Anita racetrack in Arcadia, California. And then they were taken to Heart Mountain um, Wyoming, where they spent the rest of the war. 
And this is, these stories are so important. These are stories that have been erased and that have been suppressed for many, many, many years. Um, when I grew up in the 1960s and 70s, it was, it, this would never happen in the local public library. There were very few books about that history of Japanese Americans during war, World War II. It was never taught in school, but I knew that history because I knew it from my family. I know a lot of Japanese American families are so traumatized, they never really talked about it. My family always talked about it. Their friends always talked about it. Um, we knew exactly what happened to our parents, to our grandparents, to our aunts and uncles um, during the war. And so this was my um, mother's side of the family in Hart Mountain, Wyoming. Um, and this is my father's side of the family. This is my uncle Tsuneo with my grandparents. It, it's kind of amazing. I just noticed this today in both pictures, the men are wearing suits. I mean, you, you were only supposed to bring what you can put in a, in a suitcase to in these places, Gila River, Arizona, Hart Mountain, Wyoming. I mean, in middle of nowhere, intense heat in the summer, intense cold in the winter. It's like really just, you know, they lived in these barracks. You can see downstairs, um, I guess it's a facsimile or maybe a real part of a barrack, um, but they brought suits and ties. I, I don't know what that was about. I mean, my, gran my grandfather, I never saw, my grandfather was not a guy who would, would have worn cargo shorts or anything like that. <laughs> he was always in, but he was a pastor. He was a reverend. So he was always very, um, you know, played the part. And that's my uncle Tsuneo, who was in the military intelligence service, the United States military intelligence service. And so on this side of the family, my father and my two of my uncles all served in the US Army while their parents um, were imprisoned behind barbed wire. And my father used to say um, he would visit the camp to see his family and he could, what always got him that the guards were pointing inside the camp and not outside the camp. Because to my dad, who was born in Salt Lake City, you know, they're Americans. Why are we the enemy? You know, why is my family the enemy? And he would, you know, come to visit, of course, in a US Army uniform. So again, I grew up with these stories our story, our history with my family, um, but it was invisible in the public sphere when I was growing up. And I wanna tell you one story um, about when I was in the sixth grade in Mrs. Count's class, I grew up in El Tadina, California, near Pasadena, California. And we were assigned an oral report, very much like this oral report. And I decided, well, I'm gonna do a report about the camps and my family's story. So I interviewed my mother. Oh, that's on the last picture, my mother and my grandmother. Um, my grandparents live with us. And I asked them about their experiences. And um, then I stood up there in front of my sixth grade class and started to talk about Santa Anita and Hart Mountain and what happened to them. And I can hear from the back of the classroom, Mrs. Counts screaming, what are you talking about? You're lying. I said, no, that's my mom and my grandma told me about this. And she said, that can never happen in America. They're lying to you. And I told you I was really rebellious. So I was like 10 years old. If you, there's a Leela Lee, who's a cartoonist has this character angry little Asian girl who's always <laughs> flipping the bird. And that was me. I was the original angry little Asian girl. But I knew that day that the truth was dangerous. The truth was dangerous to some people. So that meant I really want to know the truth. And I think that's the day I became a filmmaker. So I want to talk today about why our history matters, why our story matters. 
Um, because today, as Americans, we're really embroiled in this battle over who gets to tell the story. Who, who, what is the story of America and who gets to tell that story? And that narrative is so important because the narrative you know, helps us figure out our identity as a people and who belongs and who doesn't belong, who's us and who's them. So that narrative matters so much and who tells those stories also matters deeply because it's how we define ourselves um, as Americans. And I believe actually, I know there's a lot of arguments, there's these attacks on what they call critical race theory. I won't get into you know, what critical race theory really is. I believe it's really a, an attack on us telling our, our own story. Um, but there's this idea that if you tell the truth about the very difficult past, that it divides us, I think it brings us together. I mean, because wherever there is injustice, there's resistance. And so for Asian Americans, that resistance has been um, fights in the courts, at the ballot, you know, voting at the ballot box, um, standing up for justice in the streets, in the fields, and in the culture. And when you are a part of that fight of creating a more perfect union, you have this investment. It's this investment in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the idea that we all belong to this nation and that investment, because you know, otherwise it's angry little Asian girl getting elderly like me and staying really mad and feeling that I have no place within the society. But you know, I feel I have a place. You know, I feel that I have a role, I have a contribution to make. So fast forward many years later, and I want to talk a little more about my um, work as a filmmaker. Oh, who is that? That's grandpa. What am I talking about? Okay, so I, I, I got the things out. See, I'm not a very organized filmmaker. <laughs> so <laughs> where's my editor? So fast forward many years later, and uh, as Missy said, I was a showrunner and series producer of uh, history. Um, it was actually five parts. We couldn't raise the money for the sixth, sixth hour, but a history of, of Asian Americans was shown on PBS. I got to work with this dream team of other Asian American filmmakers. And the series was produced, you know, during these times. Um, in recent years, the United States has been uh, increasingly diverse, however, also increasingly divided. And we started the series with the question of how does our history help to illuminate the past, not only the past, but the present? And how does it help us understand how to move forward together? And so, as I said, you know, this was produced in our contemporary times in this time of great polarization, division, and great change, great demographic change. And so, we started the series in near the beginning, um, our origin story as Asian Americans, 1800s, early 1900s, that's where we started and we moved on uh, to the present. And it was very much like the 1619 project, um, that idea, if you know that project from the New York Times, um, Nicole Hannah-Jones and a team of reporters looked at not only the African-American experience, but the American experience by tracing back to the um, legacy of slavery and looking at how that legacy continues um, over the years to shape American lives and African-American lives. And so we want to look at uh, the history of Asian-Americans and what were those fault lines that continue to crack and widen uh, in, in um, some cases, but also um, those lines of that arc of justice that kind of, um, to me, rides over those fault lines and will ultimately overwhelm those fault lines. I'm ever optimistic. So just looking at um, that history, it, it's, 
the, was really amazing for all of us in the filmmaking team because any point of that history, we can kind of tie it to our own family stories, whether the families came, you know, our executive producer's family came in the 1800s. Um, some of people who worked with us, you know, are just recent immigrants and refugees themselves. And um, so I want to go back a little bit to, to that beginning and, you know, how that beginning of systemic racism as well as resistance really shaped our lives. Um, first, uh, the, the major wave of immigration uh, came from China, Chinese immigrants, and followed by other Asian uh, immigrants from Japan, Korea, um, the Philippines. They weren't quite immigrants. They were um, colonized people, but they came to work here, uh, South Asians, um, et cetera. And so my family was part of this um, earlier wave in the early 1900s. Um, and that was my picture of Grandpa Ujie, who you saw at Heart Mountain, um, wearing a suit at Heart Mountain. And Grandpa was the first one to come to the um, United States in 1902. I know Hawaii was not a part of the United States at that time, but he first um, left Japan and immigrated to Hawaii to cut sugar cane. Um, on the on a plantation on a sugarcane plantation, um, Asian and Portuguese and other um, workers were drawn to Hawaii because Native Hawaiians had been decimated, you know, by disease and and um, by the colonization of Hawaii, and so there was this incredible need for labor. Um, in 1906, several years, he spent several years cutting cane in, in the fields. Um, Grandpa decided for whatever reason to uh, come to the, the mainland. And so in April 1906, he got on a boat from Hawaii to San Francisco, docked at the port in San Francisco. And as soon as he got off the boat, a group of thugs went after him, you know, they screamed at him, go back to China. I mean, you know, same story as today, go back to China. They threw rocks at him, they menaced him. And so grandpa being grandpa, it's like, he's very practical. He said, I'm getting out of here. And he went straight to Los Angeles. And it, it, it was interesting for me um, in, as we're making the Asian American series, one of the stories we told was the story of Joseph and Mary Tape that, you know, that's their English names. They were Chinese immigrants. And Joseph was actually a very successful businessman in San Francisco. And one of his businesses was he would transport um, Chinese immigrants as they arrived at the port as like my grandfather, although my grandfather was Japanese. He would transport, um, the business would transport them into Chinatown where they would, you know, go to a boarding house, have a place to live, and then they would start to work. And they kept track of where the, the mobs and where the thugs were. Cause you know, sometimes they would place themselves on a bridge and you know, throw rocks at the Chinese, arriving Chinese from the bridge. It was kind of like Waze or you know, Google Maps that they, when they alert you to traffic, well, they would alert them to, um, to these thugs and then they would take another route into Chinatown. So my grandfather wasn't going to have any of that, um, went straight to Los Angeles. And as it would happen, the very next day was, guess what? The great San Francisco earthquake. So thank God for these thugs. I mean, that's why I'm here today. So grandpa, you know, skipped the earthquake and um, made it to Los Angeles, eventually married my grandmother. She was a picture bride. Um, if you don't know what picture brides were, you know, in, she was in Japan and the men who had immigrated to the US would send a picture of themselves or maybe a more handsome guy or a younger guy. <laughs> um, and then the family send it to Japan and the families would arrange a marriage. Um, it was kind of like Tinder, actually, for <laughs> Japanese in the 1920s. But and the Tinder, same thing. People send fake pictures, right? Somebody who looks better than them. 
So, so, but grandma was lucky because I mean, he's a nice looking dude. I mean, look at him. He looked, he sent the picture of himself. He, you know, was always like really nicely dressed and everything. And um, so they started a family in Los Angeles. Um, and then, as I said, this, this period of, you know, the Chinese started really coming around the gold rush in the mid 1800s and then the um, Asian immigration continued for many years. Um, as soon as people arrived, you know, of course, the hostility and the anti-immigrant sentiment, you know, first against the Chinese, the Chinese must go movement, then against the Japanese and on and on and on. Um, you know, the East Asians were seen as the yellow peril, South Asians were seen as the dusky peril or the tide of turbans, but there was this incredible animosity. And there was this huge, again, demographic change going on. So one uh, era that's so interesting to me is the late 1800s after the Civil War and after Reconstruction. And that's the time, if you look at the United States, the demographic change at that time, you had all these new non-white people in the body politic. So, um, newly freed um, Blacks, formerly enslaved Blacks. Um, you have Chinese immigrants and other Asian immigrants starting to arrive. Um, we had taken tribal lands, parts of Mexico, and uh, the United States was colonizing um, different lands and countries in the Atlantic and the Pacific. You know, Puerto Rico, um, in the Pacific, the Philippines, which was a huge nation, uh, Hawaii, Guam, uh, et cetera. And so for Americans, we have all these new people and Americans thought, well, now what do we do with them? Are they like us? Are they gonna vote like us? You know, will their, will their kids go to school with our children? Are they gonna marry, you know, our women? I mean, are they gonna bring their own families? And unfortunately, the answer was really, uh, no, not really. So um, two things happened for Asians. Asians were excluded from immigrating. The Chinese uh, 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act was the first time in American history that a whole group of people were banned from entering the United States purely based on their race. And even for people born here who had birthright citizenship, if you were born here, there's an interesting story to birthright citizenship, which was really something that was fought for um, and achieved by African Americans and by um, a Supreme Court case, uh, Wong Kim Ark, who was a Chinese American um, restaurant worker who fought for his right to um, remain a citizen because he was born in the United States. But so there, were, there is, even for those born here, um, there was this, this whole, there's Jim Crow, you know, the, 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 this whole system of laws and, and practices um, that made uh, African Americans second, right, second class citizens. Um, for Asian Americans, there were also, um, you know, similar Asian Americans in many states could not intermarry with white people. They went to segregated schools. They lived in segregated uh, neighborhoods, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and to me, when you look at systemic racism, it's really this ecosystem, an ecosystem of laws, of practices, of attitudes, of policies, of cultural images. And that ecosystem kind of keeps reproducing um, it's uh, systemic racism, it's like the pillars of systemic racism. Um, another part of it, that ecosystem is racial violence. Um, you know, in the 1800s and, and early 1900s, it was a really um, um, terrible time of, of racial violence, of course, directed at other people of color, but in terms of Asian Americans, just last month in Los Angeles, we commemorated um, the mass uh, lynching of 19 Chinese men and boys in downtown Los Angeles. And, you know, those kinds of massacres were happening all over 
the West and all over the country. Um, and cultural attitudes, it's, you know, there is in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was this time of, um, you know, racial science where uh, people were biologically defined as these racial subjects. Um, I would argue that that's when you first saw these hints of, you know, the so-called model minority in that uh, there were the um, Asians on this racial hierarchy, this continuum where whites were seen, you know, at the top of the racial, racial hierarchy, blacks and probably indigenous people at the bottom and Asians occupying the space in between. So in 1873, uh, here in California, a state legislator, I mean, he kind of summed it up um, when he said, well, this is, and I'm gonna speak in the terms that he spoke in at, at that time. He said, well, in terms of the, the, the value of a person, the worth of a person, he said, it takes two Chinamen to equal one white man. And it takes two Negroes to equal one Chinaman. So, you know, that racial hierarchy that we see today was even inscribed um, back in the 1800s. And so during that time, this narrative of um, particularly the Asian as the perpetual foreigner um, was really cemented in, in kind of the social fabric that you would always be, uh, because of the way you looked, you would always be a foreigner to this land. So I want to show you a, a clip um, of another family. This was from the Asian American series. And this is the story of, oops, let me get rid of that, sorry, go away. Um, this was a story that Connie Young Yu, who is, oh, I think Connie's like a fourth generation Chinese American and a community historian. And she tells the story of her, um, her grandfather and grandmother. Her great grandfather had actually been the first of the young family to arrive in the United States. He came here um, to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, somehow he was able to marry um, a Chinese woman and they had kids and their son became, uh, Connie's grandfather became a very successful businessman. So this is really the story of uh, Connie's grandfather and grandmother. So important that he visits the black people is his birth certificate and several letters of recommendation from black people that he was the legitimate American citizen. And that's what he needed at that time. That was worth his life. Right. My grandfather, he would go back and forth to China, but every time he traveled, his papers were checked. He wanted his family with him. So he brought his family on one of the trips he had them staying in Shanghai. In September of 1922, he was coming back and he died on the trip. My grandmother realized she had to go back to America. These were American white children. <laughs> her three sisters. My mother said, it was so exciting when they reached the Golden Gate. They could see the city and they were jumping up with joy. And then she said, and then we stopped. The Angel Island Commission, which opened in 1910, as a key point of entry for immigrants from across Asia. The next section is 
at the dock. The children were relieved because they were American citizens. But my grandmother's grief, they officially said, while well, she might have used your sleep. The inspector said to me, You're a widow. You have, your husband is not with you. A widow has no status. And she was detained. She was taken to England and questioned. Angel Island has been called the Ellis Island of the West. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Ellis Island, with the Statue of Liberty, represents immigrants being welcomed. Angel Island meant exclusion, it meant interrogation, a place to be feared. In 1977, Connie took her mother back to Angel Island for the first time in 50 years. My mother would take the ferry with her sister to visit her mother. She would try to visit her twice a week. They could only talk up to a barrier for like 15 minutes. My grandmother told my mother, when um, you leave and you go down the walkway to the boat, you look at the window of the, the barracks and I'll be waving from the top floor, I'll be waving from the window. And so my mother would um, go down and she'd see my grandmother's hand waving to her. One of the harshest punishments is to separate parents from their children. If the detention of people who are struggling to survive. Connie's grandmother sent her to the state prison before she finally able to get her to get married. And so the, for my family, for example, um, because of exclusion, anti-Asian exclusion, and because of the kind of second class um, positioning um, that Asians were put in, my grandparents were here for a half century in the United States, paying taxes, raising children, working, et cetera, et cetera, before they can be considered for uh, naturalized citizenship because they were considered aliens ineligible for citizenship for the first um, half of the 20th century. So there was no legal pathway to citizenship for Asians um, during that time uh, until the 1950s. Um, now, something very interesting happened in the 1950s and 1960s is um, they were able to get citizenship and Japanese Americans who had just been, you know, the, the enemy in the United States, you know, in prison uh, for several years in these camps like Gila River and Heart Mountain were all of a sudden the model minority. They were the model minority. And a couple of things were going on at that time in the United States. Um, say in the 1950s, the Cold War in the United States um, had to demonstrate to the world that you know, we were a democracy, um, we were a place of racial equality, and how can we argue that if you know, um, you know, there's exclusion and people are denied citizenship and African Americans, you know, are de denied um, basic rights. Um, so the Asian American was elevated as being, you know, see if you kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, then you can make it in the United States. We, they were once enemies and now, um, now they're friends and they're, they're a part of the society. The other thing that was happening is, is the civil rights movement. And so again, Asian Americans were used as this wedge. Um, see, if you were quiet and just worked hard like the Asian, um, then you can make it in America. You don't have to protest or complain or 
um, have grievances. Now, of course, the, the real story was, you know, the high rates of poverty in, in Asian communities at that time, and the fact that Asian Americans, um, not in big numbers, but, you know, in significant numbers, um, there are Asian Americans who had always um, been a part of these struggles for equality, and even uh, some who are part of the civil rights movement. Um, but so those, those perceptions of the Asian American as the perpetual foreigner and the model minority is those perceptions um, have lasted through the decades and through the years, and we can still see how it plays out today. Um, and then, you know, by the time I was born in the 1960s, um, you see this, again, a, another huge change. The America we see today, this, this increasingly, the browning of America, this increasingly diverse America, um, uh, the ground was really laid in the 1960s. Of, and for Asian Americans, you know, we're now the fastest growing population in the country. The ground was, you know, definitely laid at that time for two, two reasons. One is the 1965 um, immigration reforms, um, which gave um, preferences to family reunification and skilled workers, um, uh, who many many who came from Asia, and secondly, the arrival of Southeast Asian uh, refugees and immigrants after the fall of Saigon. Um, one thing to note about the 1965 immigration reforms is because the skilled workers was one of the preferences, it kind of created, was a self-fulfilling prophecy that created this, this pool of so-called model minorities. It was essentially a brain drain from Asia. So you had people arriving who, you know, arrived with educations, already arrived with professional degrees or professions. Um, and, uh, you know, as much as, you know, being Asian, I'd like to think, well, yeah, we're just smarter and harder working and, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's, you just have a brain drain. So you get people, you know, who are in college in Korea or, you know, Hong Kong or whatever, and they're just going to have an easier time here in the United States. Um, so it created that, 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 that sort of model minority uh, pool, which people ascribe, you know, to being like this meritocracy. Um, but, you know, there were many other Asian groups um, who arrived here without, you know, um, literacy in their kind of native, in their home countries, um, who came from like a, a rural kind of backgrounds. So they didn't have, you know, the skills of um, professional skills, etc. And they had a much tougher time um, adapting to, to life here. But so Southeast Asians, I think almost a million or over a million Southeast Asians arrived um, after the fall of Saigon. And that's really a massive amount because I think in the 1970s before that, the whole population of Asians in America was about a million. Um, so there's this huge demographic shift. And if you remember, if you were around during that time, a lot of Americans did not want them here in this country. But yet, you know, families arrived, individuals arrived. Uh, the next um, clip I'd like to show you is also from the Asian Americans. Um, it's about, you know, one family, the um, Nguyen family, and the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Viet Thanh Nguyen, amazing author, tells the story of his family in San Jose. Oops. They opened up the grocery store in downtown San Jose on East San Earth Street, which is the heart of the city. My impression of San Jose is inseparable from the experience of being a refugee. These refugees were suffering, and they're trying to build a life for themselves here, and yet they're still traumatized by the war, they're trying to forget the war. 
I remember when I was around 10 or 11 years old walking down the street from a store and seeing a sign in another store window that said, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese. And I knew that this was directed at people like my parents. My parents worked 12 to 14 hour days in the store almost every day of the year. My parents were shot in that store at 53. So for me, that kind of stayed with me because I was a good sign. That was a sport that was targeted at my parents and everybody in my parents. And so I swore one day that I would have an opportunity to rewrite that sign right in the story. And so the, you know, the, as I said earlier, wherever there's been injustice or wh wherever there's been, you know, racism, there's always been resistance. Um, and there's also always been activism and, and solidarity. And so Southeast Asians like Viet have really um, not only written our story, this new story, but they've, um, you know, taking the legacy of solidarity that they experienced um, when they arrived and have, have you know, um, push, push it forward, um, have, have replicated that in their own lives. Um, and so part of that legacy that many Southeast Asians um, a couple of years ago, uh, especially a young generation talked about is like there were, of course, many Americans who didn't want them to come to the United States, but also there were Americans who also fought for them to come to the United States. Um, there's a story that we tell in this, uh, the May 19th project that Misty mentioned. It's a series of short videos that I produced with, with other filmmakers um, last May. And one story is Bayard Rustin, who you might know as being this legendary um, black activist um, leader. He was one of the architects of the 1963 March on Washington. Um, and he was part of the International Rescue Committee um, with um, Eli Weisel and Joan Baez and many other people. And, you know, they really um, advocated for refugees um, from Central America and from Asia. Bayard Rustin visited uh, Thai refugee camps. And, you know, on, upon his return, he mobilized um, black civil rights leaders to advocate for a welcome for the United States to welcome Southeast Asian refugees. They took out like a full page ad and I think it was 1978 in the New York Times. Um, and, you know, they spoke about the, um, the, the connection between um, the refugees in Southeast Asia and African Americans. Um, also, there were voices of moral justice and people who try to welcome Southeast Asians into their own communities. A number of years ago, I was filming in Garden City, Kansas, which had been an all white rural um, community and meatpacking plants came in and they, they needed labor. So they started to bring, you know, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Ethiopian, um, you know, Mexican immigrant labor, um, people from, uh, the Czech Republic and refugees from, um, no, not the Czech Republic, but refugees from um, um, Sarajevo, from Yugoslavia. And, um, you know, they really made an effort to welcome people, particularly faith communities, Lutherans and Catholics um, and, and um, churches and, and social services in these communities. Um, my family, my on my father's side, um, after the war, because people were afraid to return to their homes in California, um, his family found refuge with a, a Quaker family, the Meeks in um, Cleveland, Ohio, who took them in. And then more recently, you see young Southeast Asians who have um, advocated for Syrian refugees and Afghan refugees. So, you know, like the, the moral voice of Southeast Asians in support of uh, welcoming and um, resettling Afghan refugees just in the past few months has been really astounding. So it's that trajectory of you know, solidarity, that trajectory, um, not 
division. I mean, people know exactly what their history is. They know exactly the history of the hostility that South Korea, of course, there was a war, I mean, for one thing, that devastated their countries, but then also the hostility that Viet's um, family met, uh, you know, when they moved here and tried to start a life. Um, but they also understand that, that solidarity. And so the, the, for Asian Americans, the one, I think, really important point is, you know, there's this idea that we're the quiet minority, but the, the story, our story that hasn't been told is the story of resistance and activism. In 18, I guess it was 1867, the single biggest labor action, labor strike in that year was Chinese immigrant railroad workers who went on strike for better working conditions and for equal pay with, with white workers. Um, my family, my uh, grandparents' generation, and my mother's generation who were survivors of the incarceration camps spoke out in the 1970s and 1980s. And um, with the Sansei, my generation, uh, pushed for a redress and reparations campaign, an apology from the United States, uh, not only an apology, but compensation and repar reparations for having lost their property and lost um, years of their lives. Um, and a law that ensured that that would never happen to another group of Americans. And Japanese Americans today are um, even the more established kind of organizations like the JACL are supportive of reparations for African Americans. Um, Japanese Americans are um, particularly those of my, my mother's generation who um, experienced the camps like um, Connie Young Yu pointed out the separation of families of a child from their parent is just you know the, the most horrific um, thing you can do is to separate families. And so Japanese Americans, Tsuju for Solidarity and other groups have been going to the Southern border and they've been advocating, you know, to close down um, family detention and to reunite uh, families, the immigrant families at, at the Southern border and, and um, in other places around the United States. And so that kind of legacy of solidarity, legacy of hope, legacy of acting together to move forward together um, is very much a part of our history. And I'm gonna end with one last clip. This is from um, one of the videos from the May 19th project. I'd be remiss to say that this was video was made by Joa Lee Grande and Steve Meng. The first one you saw was by, uh, directed by uh, Leo Chang. And then the second one uh, was directed by um, Grace Lee. I, I have to give people their, their due. And so um, I'm sorry to end on, it, show you clips of such sad stories, but I think ultimately this is like a really hopeful story. So and this was of course very recent. Is it working?
So I'll let Mrs. Lee have the last word. We need to advocate together for justice for all and for the future of our children. But so thank you very much. And um, we'll have a discussion and a Q and A session, a question and answer section, a section. And you know, I hope you um, have questions. Thank you. This mic is not working. So, um, yes. so thank you so much. That we used it in this one, I believe. So again, please, um, thank you so much, Renee. That was uh, beyond powerful. Thank you very much. Um, now to moderate the Q&A portion of tonight's program, um, Professor Zainabu Areen Davis, who is an independent filmmaker and professor of communication at UCSD. Okay. Oh, I can use this. Oh, double mics. We need double mics. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> wow. Once again, we've known each other a lot. She's one of my twentieth century friends. <laughs> Meaning, I knew her since century. <laughs> yeah. I think we've known each other since 1983. So it's oh, definitely. That long? Yeah. I wasn't born in 1983. Yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I was first looking for um, money for projects, Renee worked at a place called Third World Newsreel in New York. And so the field that we work in as filmmakers is very competitive, but the one thing that I learned from Renee back then that has stayed with me for many, many years is that if I know something, you know something. So she was like one of the first people that actually shared a grant application with me. So I learned how to write those things. So I'm always forever indebted to her to bring in me into a place where I can tell my own stories as well. Is it okay if I take this mask off? Yeah, I can, I can see. That's it. The, the teacher in me was like, okay, wait, this ain't working. <laughs> there you go. So, you know. I have to say, though, I'm glad you got something out of it because if you're looking for money, third world is real. It's not the place to go to. Well, it was because it was a place for community. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You were there. You were always laughing. <laughs> Still laughing, yeah. right? So. <laughs> That was the place I needed to be because we needed to have hope. Yeah. You know? Um, one question I want, I have two questions for you, then we'll open up. Um, first question I wanted to ask you, which is actually related to one of the takeaways that I got from your talk today. And you said, if you tell the truth about what divides us, it brings us together. And I know and you know that doing this filmmaking work is like, dang, why did this thing pick us? So 
I wanted you to just elaborate just a little bit more on why you continue to tell the stories that you do, even though they may be so painful. Um, well, whenever I make a film, I think, and just my own experience of living is there's, you know, where there's troubles, where there's injustice, as I said, there's always a way forward. I mean, people do um, work together. People do bring something out of themselves individually and collectively to make change. I mean, so I, I felt like this whole thing about, you know, don't talk about like, racism in the past, it just makes people feel bad. To me, it's kind of like if you go to a therapist, can you imagine if your therapist said, oh, let's not talk about your childhood. Because <laughs> that's in the past. Um, that's not going to help. It's like, why don't we better kind of figure out what's going on? And, and the other thing is, you know, when people feel injustice, they're angry and disaffected. And so you've got a lot of really angry, disaffected people. And so what happens with that anger and that rage? Um, if that anger and that rage can become a part of change, moving for change, that just makes everything better for everybody. But um, so, it, yeah, so the, the films I've made, I mean, I make, I choose a topic generally because something really pissed me off. But then when you actually get and dive into the story and you meet people and you see like, you know, what they've done and how they, um, you know, created this, a better world. I mean, you always see that. So that, that to me is, you know, that, that is very uplifting. To me. Yeah, and I think, you know, the fact that you tell stories through different means like the way that you know Miss Breed's legacy was through those letters and then the way that you use the legacies of these people that are telling their stories that are often very painful it's a way to transform us and there's a way to bring hope um, and like the last thing that you led, left off on the idea of solidarity you know how important that is for us and so I wanted to bring it up to date a little more and ask you to comment on the murders of the women in Atlanta. Yeah, so I, I think that's a really good example of why history and our story matters. Um, if you remember, Mar actually, the murders happened March 16th, uh, 2021. Well, it's just this past month. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was a year to the day after uh, President Trump first tweeted Chinese virus. Mm -hmm. And you see like this whole year of um, anti-Asian violence. I mean, that's not the only thing that, you know, causes it. It's just like this general, um, you know, marginalization, demonization of, of Asians as a disease. And so the day after the shootings where Aaron Wong, you know, targeted three Asian businesses, murdered eight people, six of whom were Asian women, um, the Cherokee County Sheriff gave, the, the spokesperson gave a press brief, briefing and said, well, I talked to Aaron Wong. He said, there's nothing racial about it. I just had a sex addiction and I had a very bad day. And so that narrative, but right away, Asian Americans called BS. And particularly Asian American um, women scholars and organizers look back to history. And even before the Chinese Exclusion Act was the 1875 Cage Act, and that was targeting Chinese immigrant women. Well, Chinese women were banned from coming into the United States as a result of the, the Page Act because they were seen, the justification is that, you know, they're prostitutes um, and bearers of disease. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other, I mean, even the American Medical Association issued, I couldn't believe it when I saw this, issued this warning that, you know, the Chinese have bring these diseases that they're immune from, but these women will infect white men and then oh these men will die. So that idea of the Asian woman as being this 
expendable other mm -hmm. uh, bearer of the deed, um, you know, hypersexual, that's something that's been, you know, consistent with embedded in the DNA of the, you know, American psyche over the generations, particularly because if you look at poor wars, US wars during the 20th century, they're all fought in Asia. You know, the US Philippines War, the Pacific War, the war in Korea, and the war in Southeast Asia. And so this this idea of the Asian women was, you know, when um, troops are there for R and R, you know, they're like the bar girl, you know, the bar girls or you know, the the objects, the sexual sexualized objects. So you, you can't discount, and maybe, you know, I always think the instance of racial violence is not just one thing that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe he was having a bad day. Maybe he did have a sex, sex addiction, but maybe that sex addiction was linked to his um, seeing the Asian woman as being like this, this temptress, you know, mm -hmm. who's leading him down this sinful path. And, and you can never discount who's seen also as being expendable. So you have, actually have to ask that question. You have to um, offer these, these different narratives, um, you know, based on what your, your understanding is. And we understand um, our history and we understand the lives that, that we've lived. Yeah, and I think it points back to what you also talked about in your talk about systemic racism, how that's so ingrained into us, so we really don't even recognize and confront it. Um, even as we have these like, you know, acts of violence that just kind of get, you know, brushed off as a, as a fluke or, you know, just one crazy person doing something. There's something else that's going on that makes those things continue and continue to happen, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And, and I will say, because, you know, it's been, at least the story has been that particularly older Asian women have been the targets of, you know, this wave of anti-Asian violence and have seen older, or older, older Asian women. And, but I have to say that in the past year, you know, I thought about um, this, I haven't had much fear, you know, when I've gone out, I live in Los Angeles. And I spent a lot of time, you know, between June and maybe November of uh, last year, all over Los Angeles, out on the streets, because I was filming the um, the social justice um, after George Floyd, the social justice um, protests. And you know, they're all they're always done. I don't know, because I think you're young people and things are so lovely. It's always done at night. And it's also you know, too hot in the daytime. And so, you know, I was just, it was just me. I didn't have a camera person or a crew. And I would just have my camera. I'd be, you know, following them around. So I'd be, you know, all kinds of neighborhoods at night. As you know, like downtown LA, it's like empty at night. So it's kind of scary. Um, but I was never frightened because you know, there were these young people and they were like black, white, brown, indigenous, Asian, they were just, you know, all backgrounds. And I knew they were there to protect me. They were there to defend me. Mm -hmm. So I'd be so relieved anytime I saw a young person with like, you know, a, a, a sign or something, buttons all over their jacket, because I knew, well, these people are, they're there you know, to fight hate, to fight violence, and to fight intolerance, and they're there to stand beside me. Mm -hmm. And so I always felt very, you know, just like taken care of. Thank God for that. Yeah. Okay, we can take a couple questions from the audience. Does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. And I have to repeat your question. I'm sorry. So, uh, Lady Kitawa, The JACL is the Japanese American Student Association. Anybody else? Any questions, comments? Yes. Yes, 
So there's a curriculum for the Asian American series, uh, PBS Women in Media. It's all free, it's really terrific. Um, I actually did one project that was based on an idea of my sons who wanted to play Minecraft. And so um, we were at the, um, we went with my parents to a pilgrimage to Park Mountain where they have a, a museum, like a church food center. And um, he started to, because he was talking to my mom and my uncle and, you know, looking at the different sites, the barracks and everything. So he started to create a virtual Park Mountain on Minecraft. And Minecraft, if you don't know what it is, it's kind of like a computer um, Lego thing where you can build these worlds and build these, um, these um, structures and everything. And so we created this whole curriculum um, with support from the National Park Service and um, from, there's a, a civil liberties fund here in California. And so essentially it's, it's video so that, and different learning resources so that kids, it's like second grade to maybe um, eighth grade is sort of the prime Minecraft year. So they can learn about the history of World War II incarceration and then work together to build these uh, virtual camps. There's also this, um, this kind of game or exercise where they have a virtual suitcase and they have to, and all these different items and they have to figure out like what can they take mm -hmm. to camp with them. Wow. And so, you know, you can't take a lot of things. I mean, certain things were banned, but then like, should I take roller skates or just a warm coat, you know, because mm -hmm. you're going to be there for years in this strange place. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, I've done some things. I think we're all like thinking about, um, Curriculum these days. Yeah, definitely in light of the critical race theory controversies. Yeah. There was a question at the back. No. <laughs> you know, the, so for me and also the other filmmakers I work with, I mean, I think there, we have two parts to our lives as filmmakers. One, we make films, but secondly, we try to mentor other filmmakers, particularly young filmmakers, and, and make it possible, you know, nurture their, their projects. So I hope all these stories are done by other filmmakers. I mean, there are more stories to be told. In fact, they are, you know, making films about these stories. And what's really exciting is, um, people from new Asian communities, like Southeast Asian communities, Bangladeshi, you know, communities in Nepal, you know, Burmese, etc. Um, also in places like the South and the Midwest, um, you know, outside of the metropolitan production centers like San Francisco, LA, and New York. I mean, they're, they're starting to really um, tell their own stories, which, you know, I found really, I mean, they can tell, they tell their stories in a way I could never approach. Yes. Library. Well, I, you know, as I said, my mother was a typist in our local library, so I spent a lot of time there. So yeah, I actually used to, you know, I don't think they do this anymore, but they used to bound, bind all the Time magazines and Life magazines. And so I spent, I think that's where like my visual education was. I would just spend hours looking through these magazines and all the amazing pictures. I don't know, did, did they do that anymore? Library, you have that, or yeah, 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 yeah,
It's really amazing. And then also, I'm sorry, I'm gonna pump it to the, the May 19th project is on YouTube. The May 19th project we saw um, from the, um, the last piece of this is a George Floyd piece, and this is the Lee piece. And that's 14 short videos. They're only like two or three minutes, but they're very easy to see. And those are all free. Um, CSUnite.com has, uh, you can see it, and you can also see them on YouTube. May 19th project. Yes. Uh, are there any activists outside of your family and people like Sarah or anything that you looked up to when you were coming up? Oh, yeah. I mean, a, a close family friend named Yuri Kochiyama, yeah. uh, who was who actually, so she was a Japanese American who was also incarcerated. She was incarcerated in uh, Arkansas and Mississippi. And she became, she was very close to Malcolm X. Um, she was a lifelong activist. And she was actually a friend of my mom's in Santa Anita Racetrack when they were both incarcerated together. She mm -hmm. used to organize all the girls to write letters to the Japanese American GIs mm -hmm. overseas, who were Nisei soldiers. And they would write like, you know, thousands of letters um, to the soldiers. And her, she married a uh, Bill, was she actually met him at Camp Shelby. He was in the 442nd, so he became her husband. And he used to get letters. He would say, oh God, there's so many letters I know to do with them. <laughs> yeah, it's like her straight man, but, um. <laughs> but yeah, she was she was amazing. She was amazing because she was so you know in politics you, you can get like very polarized and sectarian. But Yuri was you know she really almost listened to everybody. I, I learned a lot from her. Not just keeping your heart open to a lot of people who. And um, just for a point of information, May 19th is because that's about the birthday of Malcolm X, and it's also Yuri Kochiyama's birthday. They're born on the same day, different years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This question right here. They were, they were, the children were in San Francisco. I, I don't know who watched them. Maybe the older children watched the younger children. Because the father had died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's happening now, I'm sure, in many families. Yeah. Yeah. You have one more question over there? Do you have a question? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Biographies of female directors. Yeah, not quite. But you did mention, I'm not sure if I'm getting your question, but you mentioned sports. And I actually made a little video about my dad, who's a Cubs fan, and who, who self evacuated. He was just graduating from high school. And if you're Japanese American when the war broke out after Pearl Harbor, you, you could evacuate outside of the West Coast. Of course, most people couldn't because they were afraid and they had nowhere to go. But my dad, being my dad, being like 18, 18 year old kid, he got on a train and went to Chicago and just like, you know, had 
time of his life. <laughs> there was a need for labor, so he got a job. Where he went to Chicago, there was an old Palmer House hotel, mm -hmm. really great hotel. He got a job there waiting tables or something like that. And he was already a Cubs fan um, from when he was a little kid. He grew up in, mostly in Salt Lake City in LA, but somehow he was a Cubs fan. And, um, so <laughs> about the, his World War II experience and being his cup fan and then following him to, we got him tickets to one of the games at the series um, in 2018, World Series. It was 2009 or 17. Yeah. 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 Now he died like not too long after the series, but still we're so happy. That he, he got to see it win. He got to see <laughs> win, finally yeah. win. Yeah. It was, really it was terrific because he, I mean, he was a veteran. And so he would always wear his World War II veterans cap. And when we went to Wrigley Field to drop him and my cousin off to get their seats, it's like, you know, crazy. Like, how can we get, because he was, you know, he was like using a cane and everything. But then these two cops, like we asked him directions and one said, Oh yeah, my grandfather was a World War II vet too. And so they they said, no, you just come with us. So they escorted him into like they used the where the players enter and all the VIPs oh, cool. enter. And people were applauding him because they thought he was like a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Finally. We have time for one more, that's it. One more? Anybody? Yes. Did anyone ever introduce Tara Breed as to how she got so involved in the social justice movement? I'm not sure. I know I have a video yeah. with kids about Tara Breed's story. Do you know if anybody's ever? Actually, did I? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Many years, yeah. 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 But Miss Breed was also, as Scott said in the back, she was very modest too. So, you know, she kept those letters for so many years. And then finally, you know, they were taken and you, you have the facsimile, facsimiles of them in the exhibit now. So, you know. And, uh, we, we, do, uh, we, we do know that, that, that there is a, uh, there is a uh, local author here. She's doing a uh, this author novel. Uh, I don't know how, how, it's, how it's going to be, but, uh, She's interviewed everyone who knows Miss Briggs and possibly plus an opportunity to, to mention Susan Hasegawa is here. Susan. Uh -huh. Susan Hasegawa is right here. Yay. Uh, Rebecca Cantor is the author. And she, 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 she's very interested in Susan because she works with Miss Briggs. And the reason I'm Susan, Susan, Professor was and is our consulting hour. Our project Long story short, look out for the novel. Wrap it up. Go ahead. You wrap it up. I want to wrap it up. Thank you so, so much for being here. Big thank you to Professor Whitney. Thank you.
Thank you. 